Jeremiah 29, 11. I'll be reading from the NIV version. And it reads, For I know the plans I've had for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You may be seated in the presence of God. If you give me a few minutes, I'd like to preach a message entitled, Back to the Future. Back to the Future. That Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a popular scripture that, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper and not harm you, to give you hope in the future. You see it hanging up, especially if you're in a black family, you'll see it quite often. Everybody knows about Jeremiah 29, 11, but a lot of people fail to realize the context and when Jeremiah stated this. This is a part of a letter that Jeremiah is writing to the people of Judah who are in exile. What exile means is it's a period of time where they have been forcefully removed from their homeland, which is Judea, and forced to live in a foreign land named Babylon. This all happened because their country, Judah, if you look at the map, their country, Judea, was taken over by a king named King Nebuchadnezzar. He was a powerful king. He had the Babylonian Empire. He was taking over all these territories. And when it came to Judea, Judea said, man, we don't want to follow your rules. So they started rebelling. And because they started rebelling, the Bible says that he crushed their hometown. He crushed their temple, which they worshipped in, and they were forced to go all the way to Babylon. But they didn't get there by accident. I said it last week. The things that we consider accidental are not accidental at all. We often take intentional steps in order to get to that place. What we consider accidental are not really accidents. We take intentional steps to get there. The people of Judah have been warned time and time and time and time about by the prophets that if y'all don't get this thing right, if y'all don't start being obedient to God, there are going to be consequences. And they did it anyway. They kept being disobedient, and as a result, here they are in exile. Now you have to understand, they were forced to walk from Judea all the way to Babylon. Theologians believe it was somewhere between 500 and 900 miles. Said that it took them weeks, it took them months. When I read that, that 5K didn't look so bad. I think I'll get ready to go on stretch and run that old 5K. It didn't seem too bad. But Jeremiah is letting them know there's hope. He's writing them in this letter, letting them know, hey, there is hope. The issue is, it's going to take 70 years. Not seven years. Because that's a long time. But it's, going to, it's, it's hope, but it's going to take them 70 years in order to achieve this hope. So Jeremiah tells the people there in his letter, he said, um, y'all might as well start building some homes. Hey, y'all, y'all might as well start selling here. In other words, hey, you need to start getting comfortable in what's uncomfortable. Because you're going to be here for a while. But sometimes you have to get out of what you're used to because it can become detrimental to you. No, no, sometimes you have to remove yourself from what you're used to. Because if you stay there too long, it can become detrimental to you. Jeremiah tells him, hey, matter of fact, y'all start planting some plants. Y'all create a garden. He says, get married. He said, have some kids. Because, again, y'all ain't going nowhere for a long while. He said, matter of fact, them prophets and them fortune tellers y'all been listening to among y'all, he says, y'all can really stop listening to them. He says, y'all force them to have these dreams because you want a plan for hope. He said, of course, they just lie to you and tell you what you want to hear. He said, but they're not from God. So you might as well stop listening to them. He says, but hey, check this out. After 70 years, you're going to be good. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, this is why people hated Jeremiah. Because every time he came around, it seemed like he always had some bad news. He always had nothing good to say. But the crazy thing is, he's saying exactly what God told him to. And people hated him, hated him for it. To the point where even Jeremiah started to complain himself. Like, look here, God, you set me up. You done tricked me. Because every time I open my mouth and say what you told me to say, people hate me. Matter of fact, they want to kill me. It's, it's, it's violence that's coming my way. But he says, when I don't do what you told me to do, when I don't say what you told me to say, he says, then it's like fire that shut up in my bones. 
Boy, I'm preaching and some music coming out. Yeah, this is the futuristic. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. No. But he says it's like fire shut up in my bones. He says, and I got to get it out. This is Jeremiah walking in his purpose. This is Jeremiah walking in his purpose. Can you imagine someone coming to you saying, I see how you're walking in your purpose. I see what you're doing. Your purpose looks good. And Jeremiah, of course, is he's standing there looking crazy because he's like, purpose don't always feel good. My purpose don't always look good. But purpose is good. The thing about it is purpose is not always popular. It's not always popular. Why are you turning it off? I was, I was digging that futuristic music. I like you. That's a special anointing God then gave me. I had to look at the mic. What's going on here? But purpose is not always popular. It always doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good. But it is good because the truth is anything that God puts his hands on is good. No, anything God puts his hands on is good. The Bible says that on the sixth day. When God created the earth, he sat back and he said, it is very good. He didn't sit back and ask the birds, hey, what y'all think? Y'all think this look good? He didn't put his arm around a donkey and say, hey, bro, check this out. What, what you think? He said it was good. He didn't wait for people's acceptance. Lecrae said it best. If you live for people's acceptance, you're going to die from their rejection. See, in order to get back, in order to go back and get back to the future, you're going to have to go against the odds. You're going to have to go against the odds. The opposite word of exile means to return. So in order to return to the future, in order to get back to the future, you're going to have opposition. A lot of us want promises, but we don't want problems. We want promises, but we don't want promised problems. We want the promised land, but we don't want the giants that come with it. We want the promised land, but we don't want the giants that come with it. God has a plan, and it does not change based off the fact that you have problems in this text. If y'all put the scripture back up, it says, God says, for I know. We can stop right there. He says, I already know. I already know. I already know you got struggles. I already know you got issues. I already know you got insecurities. I already know you jacked up and got problems. He says, I already know, but I still got a plan. No, no, I already know, but I still have a plan. I know. He knows, even when we don't. God is certain even when we are not. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. That word declare is important because it puts authority behind it. That word declare lets you know that it comes directly from God. Oh, my God. It comes directly from God. That word declare. When you put authority behind it, I declare it's power that comes with it. I tell my five-year-old daughter sometimes, to go upstairs and tell her siblings, hey, tell them, let's go. Tell them, let's go. And before she makes the stairs, I say, wait a minute, tell them, daddy said, let's go. And she go up there with confidence, yelling, hey, daddy said, let's go. And I hear feet scrambling. That's the confidence we should have in the Father. That's the confidence that we should have in God. And she's so confident that she knows she's going. She don't know where she's going, but she knows that she's going. God says, I have plans to prosper you. That word prosper is not just limited to money and material things. We make it about money. We make it about material things. And as a result, we miss what God is trying to make. We miss what God is trying to create. We miss what God is trying to do. That's what I explain to people about giving. Giving has nothing to do with your money. It's about what God wants to do in your life. People just say, well, God, do it without my money then. If you're going to do it, do it without my money. And that sounds good, but there's just one problem. If you bring nothing to the table, then God is not obligated to do something with you. See, you can't offer nothing and then expect something. No, no, you cannot offer nothing and expect something. That's like you not studying and expecting to make a good grade. It's based off a of condition. It's based off of principles. It's certain things into play. The love of God is unconditional. The love of God is unconditional. That means God going to love you regardless, no matter what you do, no matter what you go through. God is always going to love you. The love of God is unconditional. The issue is his promises are not. They're tied to something. They're connected to something. 
So you cannot sever the ties and then still desire and think you're going to get what's on the other side. You can't sever ties and then think you're going to get what's on the other side. Prosperity is a whole thing. It's not just about finances. It's about peace. It's about wholeness. It's about well-being. Nobody, this is the thing. The will of God and the design of God is not to have you in a constant state of brokenness. That's not from God. A lot of people think, man, I'm broken. God, man, he's just giving me strength. I got to go through it. The will of God is not for you to be in a constant state of brokenness. That is not the design of God. God says, I have plans to prosper you, and then he follows up not to harm you. I got plans to prosper you and not to harm you. A sure thing is always followed by reassurance. A sure thing is always followed by reassurance. The issue is we as people, it's the timing of the reassurance. See, we want, to, we want the sure thing and then we want the sure reassurance right after. Just the other day I told my wife I love you. She didn't say it back in two seconds. Never mind, don't worry about it. I'm good. She, you ain't giving me a chance. Don't, don't worry about it. It, it. You don't need it. It's fake. I don't want it no more. Because we want the sure thing and we want the reassurance to come right after. We want things on our time, but that's not God's time. And God doesn't mean no harm. God says, I got plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Not to harm you. That counters and offsets the fear, the doubt that we as people may have about the will of God. It lets us know that God's plan is good even when we can't see it in the moment. The reassurance is what counters fear. Reassurance is what counters fear. That's why I tell people all the time the opposite of faith, the opposite of fear is not faith. The opposite of fear is not faith. The opposite of fear is love because the Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. A sure thing is always followed by reassurance, but it's the timing of the follow. When somebody's following you, it doesn't always have to be in close proximity. Some people follow you from a distance. We want the follow to be close up. We want the sure thing and we want the reassurance, but sometimes it's at a distance. My homeboy, Principal Terry Riley, I never forget. When you talk to this man, you could just tell, like, boy, you're going to be a principal one day. It was years ago, like, you just, it was a sure thing. You are going to be a principal. And I remember year after year, you applying for principal job. Hey, bro, I got a job, man. Hey, I'm saying, what time you got? 10 o'clock. Set my alarm for 10. I'm praying. What time you got this year? 11. And time after time again, I would call the check. Bro, I didn't get it. Dang. Well, like, we, we know you're supposed to be a principal. Well, maybe you, do you need to switch district? Do you need to do this? Man, but I, I feel led to be here in Mesquite, man. It's a sure thing. It's a sure thing. It's a sure thing. And then finally this year. This year. Yeah, y'all can clap for that. Nah, boy, stand up. Let them see you. Let them see you. Yo. After years of applying to be a principal this year, this year, he finally became a head principal. I'm talking about the school that he is now over. He could jog to work. I ain't going to say, why well, we got to bust a light job. He can jog to work. The reassurance came. It just was not in close proximity. Delay is not denial. Delay is not denial. Delay is not denial. The Bible is evident of that when it tells the story about Daniel. The Bible says that Daniel prayed. And God says, as soon as you prayed, I heard you, and I sent my angel, Michael. He was on his way. As soon as you prayed, I sent him. He says, but he got tangled up with the prince of Persia. The reassurance was, was following. It was on its way. It just was not in close proximity because it was went through opposition. It's a distance. Delay is not denial. God says, I'm going to give you hope in a future. I'm going to give you hope in the future. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That means faith and hope go hand in hand. God already knows you need faith to believe. It really takes faith to believe. And God is so good. He says, I know it takes faith to believe, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you the faith that you need in order that you can believe. The Bible says that each one of us have been given a measure of faith. Everybody in this room has been giving a measure of faith. All of us have been dealt a measure of faith. The faith that you feel you need, you already have. 
Now, now the faith that you feel you need, you, you already have. People be trying to conjure your faith. Oh, God, oh, man, come on, God, come on now. Baby, I need some more faith. The faith that you have is what you already need. It's the whole reason when the apostles asked Jesus, they say, hey, look here, increase our faith. We need some more faith. Jesus said, look here, if you got faith the size of a mustard seed, he says, you can, you, can, you can talk to this tree, this mulberry tree, and tell it to be uprooted from where it's at and be put into sea, and it will obey you. Because it's not about increasing your faith. It's whether you have it or not. It's not about the size of your faith. It's not about increasing your faith. It's about whether you have it or not, and you got it. It just has to be revealed. It's just got to be revealed. i never forget when I was in second grade, man, I was preparing for this speech. I was preparing for this speech, right? Y'all don't pay attention to my edge up. My mama used to cut my hair. I love you, mama, if you're watching. But, uh, hey, the boy, I'm sensitive about it. I said my mama used to cut my hair now. But I was preparing for a speech in second grade. And I had just a few words. All I had to say at the end was, thank you, everyone, for coming out to the PTA meeting. That's it. I'm talking about I had been practicing for a week. Thank you, everyone, for coming out to the PTA meet. It seems so simple. I'm practicing, I'm practicing, I'm practicing. The night comes, and I get up there. And I say, thank you, everyone. I mess up. I say, dang. I say, thank you, everyone. I messed up. And they were laughing just like y'all do. And finally, I looked up and seen all them people, and I just started crying. The principal had to come up, get the mic, put his arms around me, and say, thank you, everyone, for coming out to the PTA meet. That haunted me for years. I went to junior high, I went to high school, man. I was always good at presentations, always good at putting visuals, doing all this stuff. And then when I became a minister, it was time for me to preach my first sermon. I hadn't thought about that story in years. Time for me to preach my first sermon. And right before I'm about to get up there, it's like the enemy came in my head and said, boy, you remember second grade? How are you going to get up here and preach? You couldn't even say thank you for coming out to a PTA meeting. You think you're about to come up here and deliver a word? But it was something in me that let me know. God spoke to me and said, fam, you had faith back then. He said, the same faith you have back then is the same faith you have right now. He says, but tonight it's going to be revealed. And I remember I got up there. Name of the sermon was, now is not the time, help me. That was like, what type of name is that? I said, you about to find out. And I went up there and I delivered that sermon. You have the faith. It just has to be revealed. That means you have to discover your faith. You have to discover your purpose. That means you have to discover. You have to discover. That means you have to take off the cover. You have to take off the mask that you wear. See, most people in this room, we wear masks. And we wear so many of them. We're good at it. We know how to switch them out. Let me take this one off. Okay, I'm going in this setting. I'm going amongst these people. I'm going to grab this mask. Okay, not them. Let me go and grab this mask, and I'm going to put it on. You have to learn how to take off the mask. The Bible said that the whole world is waiting on the sons and their daughters to do what? To reveal themselves. To reveal themselves. To uncover and take off the mask. For my students, some of y'all getting ready to go back to elementary, junior high, high school. Some of y'all getting ready to go off to college. Even some adults are getting ready to go back to school. You're getting ready to go back to school. But my whole message today is don't forget to go back to the future. Because what the future is, is the plan of God. We don't have to wait 70 years like the people of Judah. The future is not. The future is today. And understand this, you're going to have problems. When you go back to school, you're going to have problems. Some of y'all might have in the first week. Some of y'all might have in the last week of school. But the, pro the issue is you're going to have problems. Problems are going to arise. But remember that you have a promise. Remember that you have a plan. You always acknowledge your problems. And if so, you always address your problems. But your focus has to be God. My focus stays on the things above. It's not that I dismiss and act like the problems don't exist. Because when you do that, I always say that's sweeping dirt under the rug. It ain't went nowhere. And sooner or later, that rug will lift. And when that rug starts to lift, people and things will start to trip. People and things that's connected to you. So you do acknowledge your problems. You address your problems. But it does not get my focus. My focus has to stay on God. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you and not harm you, to give you hope in a future. If you get back to the future, you will never be lost. Now, any time you stray too far, if you know how to get back to the future, you will never be lost. Getting back to the future is simply getting back to the plan of God. The future starts today. It don't start tomorrow. You know, when I was getting this sermon, I'm like, God, I know Jeremiah 29 and 11. That is what Back to the Future is built on. But, you know, it just ain't really a cuddly message for kids. That's what I'm thinking. Give me some fluff. Give me one of them nice messages that I can just come in and preach. Ten minutes and we out. But God reminded me that Jeremiah was young when he accepted his call. It doesn't give his exact age, but theologians believe that he was a teenager because when God comes with them with his plan, Jeremiah said, God, look, I'm too young. I'm too young. And God convicted me. He said, you keep discounting these kids acting like they can't get it done. But he always reminds me that the disciples were young men. He said they were not adults. You are never more effective than when you are young. You are never more effective than when you are young. Because the younger generation is always going to look up to you. Your peers are going to look to you. And as we as older people, if we're looking at a kid, if they can do it, then surely we can. We got to get back to the future. 